good morning good afternoon and good evening to all our speakers yes and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world welcome back to yet another episode of very educative lectures for you the speaker for the first session of today is our distinguished faculty from japan professor masahito kawabori professor kawabori's clinical expertise is in the surgical treatment of cerebrovascular diseases in both open and endovascular he is one of the qualified surgeons for endovascular thrombectomy and does his practice not only in the university hospital but also in the affiliated hospitals he is a principal investigator for the stem cell clinical trial named research on advanced intervention using novel bone marrow stem cell rainbow project and stem cell therapy for traumatic brain injury which is the stem tra trial his research interests include stem cell therapy for brain damage mechanisms of sphingolipid for protection of brain from various damage he bases effort on the education of young neurosurgeons about cerebrovascular and endovascular treatment he has won several awards and honors for his outstanding contribution to neurosurgery in his country we are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars and today he'll be talking about stem cell therapy for cns diseases the speaker for the second session of today's webinar is our honored guest from india who is one of the pioneers of endoscopic spine surgery professor malcolm pestonji professor pestonji is a consultant in orthopedics at the golden park hospital wasai maharashtra india he is also an honorary professor of endoscopic spine surgery at the bareilly international university of royal kan medical college hospital as well as honorary endoscopic spine surgeon at the holy spirit hospital and there is mumbai he specializes in endoscopic spine procedures and is a renowned faculty at the ao spine and also invited faculty to various conferences and workshops in the country we are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to be speaker at our webinars and today we'll be talking about endoscopic fusion under awake aware anesthesia the chair for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from taiwan professor shin john ling Professor Lin is a professor of neurosurgery and superintendent of Alin Suchi Hospital, Taiwan. He is a fellow of the American Association of Advancement of Sciences as well as international fellow of American Association of Neurological Surgeons. He is a co-editor in chief of the journal Cell Transplantation. He was the chairman 10th Pan Pacific Symposium on Stem Cells and Cancer Research. His clinical interests are focused upon brain tumors, specifically gliomas. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Kawabori today. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Japan, Professor Yusuke Nishimura. Professor Nishimura is Associate Professor, Chief and Director of Department of Spine Program at Nagoya University, Japan. His clinical interests are focused upon minimally invasive spine surgery. He was a previous fellow at the University of Toronto with Professor Ginsberg and Professor Michael Fillings. He is a noted author with several publications in various period journals. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Malcolm Pestonji. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chairs and the audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China and we are extremely thankful to professor shubin for broadcasting the webinar on the wechat channel dr lubun singh from malaysia is my co-host for today and with that introduction i would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair professor shin jong lin uh, thank you dr raja uh, i'm uh, uh, dr shin jong lin uh, english name jong lin i'm the uh, professor of neurosurgery at the uh, tsuji university and also the superintendent of the uh, Tsuji Medical Centers. So welcome you all to Hua Lian. Today our uh, speakers is uh, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Kawa Boris, MD, PhD. Uh, he would like to speak uh, us on the stem cell therapy for the uh, central nerve system diseases. Uh, Dr. Kawa Bori, please. Dr. Lin, thank you very much for your uh, invitation. So uh, I would like to talk about our uh, recent uh, publication and the development about the stem cell therapy for CNS disease. So um, I, I, I thought that there may be a several uh, Chinese or Taiwanese um, audience. So I also um, made a slide uh, in, in Chinese language so that maybe people can understand a little more. So I'm Dr. Kawabori from Hokkaido University, and it's a great honor to, for me to speak about this um, wonderful uh, seminar. So as you know that there are currently, first, this is the current status of stroke recovery. So there may be a prevention or treatment and rehab, but even though uh, many patients are still left with a very severe, uh, secular, which means the hemiparesis. 
and many doctors are trying to decrease the uh, the blood pressure control or to expand the public awareness or IV therapy and the catheter treatment, including including the thrombectomy. Or some people are trying robots for uh, regenerating the uh, the regaining their functional deficit. But what we thought is that uh, the stem cell therapy may um, add a uh, value to the patient. And uh, so um, stem cell therapy may give additional benefit to the patient. And uh, as you know, that there are several uh, sources of stem cells. First, there is embryonic, embryonic stem cells, so-called ES cells. And, and the iPS cells is induced pluripotent stem cells and mesenchymal stem cells. And the first one that the human developed is the ES cell. They have a very good point that they, they, they possess a pluripotency, which means that they can produce any cells theoretically uh, from the cells. However, this cell contains an ethical issue that the cell must be obtained from aborted, aborted cells, which means that it is kind of a life. And it is very uh, difficult for a Catholic to, to, to use these kind of cells. So what we developed is that iPS cell, which also possesses the pluripotency, but can be obtained from the patient itself. Just adding a four, um, for a special RNA into the cells. So this cell uh, cleared the, no, the ethical issue that the ES cell possesses. However, they also possess one demerit that uh, it still has a tumor, genes tumor genesis that the cell cannot be controlled. Um, and they may produce a tumor. That is one of the different difficulty of using iPS cell for the clinical use. However, for the mesenchymal stem cells, um, MSC, it has a low immune rejection and does not have ethical issues. So this is very good for use in the clinical trial. However, their difficulty or the cons is that they have a limited differentiation. That means that they're not as perfect as ES cell or the iPS cells. However, we thought that this MSC is the fastest uh, cells that we can use for the clinical use. And the MSC can be obtained from bone, fat, and the blood or the blood vessel and the tooth. And we use the bone marrow to generate the MSC. So mechanism of recovery of MSC there may be a two big difference, different uh, me mechanisms. First, the differentiation of MSC. The cell itself can differentiate into neuronal cells or vascular cells. This is um, this is kind of kind of like the same thing as the ES cell or the iPS cell that possesses. However, the MSC also possesses a different mechanism that has a nursing effect that they relieve the damage of the the brain relief, the brain damage, or accelerate the recovery. These are also the main effect of MSC in the field of mechanism. And these are the uh, some of our results from our lab that uh, about nursing effect that the cell uh, can release a lot of <clears throat> a lot of uh, trophic factors to to recover the cell of damaged. So the neurons, the BMSC, the MSC can release a pretty amount of neurological growth factors or brain-derived brain neurotrophic factors um, compared with the control. And, the, and also the, the cells that transplanted into the brain also expresses a high amount of uh, trophic factors which help the brain, uh, which help the brain from relieving the damage or accelerating the recovery. And they also uh, regulate inflammations, uh, both systemically and locally. 
So we found that the uh, intravenously administered MSC can lower the uh, trophic factors with uh, actually uh, can lower the damaged proteins TNF alpha or one uh, one L one beta, which exaggerates the brain damage. But with the use of MSC, we can you can see that we can decrease the amount of troph uh, of inflammation factors in in the systemic inflammation and also in the local brain inflammation. And we what we know is that uh, the the cells that regular that MSC can express a whole amount of uh, trophic factors which can regenerate the neurogenesis. So with the amount of uh, when the cell is implanted into the brain, we found that a newly uh, developed neurons are 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 coming from the uh, subventricular zone zone of the brain, and which will become a mature neuron to regenerate the neuronal circuit. And also, we found that uh, these factors can regenerate the axons. This is one of the sli slice of the spine. We cut the spine and put the stem cell in uh, around the, uh, at the corner of the damaged spine. And we found that a whole amount of uh, axons coming from stem cell to the, to the spinal cord. So we found that the new right extension can also be found by, the, uh, by this uh, stem cell administration. Uh, but uh, there may be there are several mechanisms to I, I, as I said there is a, a nursing effect and also a differentiation. But as we as far as we know that the nursing effect is especially uh, useful in the early stage, while uh, differentiation uh, of the stem cell are useful at the later stage. This is one of the figure from the uh, Dr. Hess, one of the leading uh, doctors in the field of uh, stem cell in the stroke. He says that using the, uh, until 24 hours, it is neuroprotective, but however, up to one month it is neurorestorative. And in this period, intravenous or maybe intravenous or intraarterial transplantation of the stem cell is better. However, after one month, the neurorestorative uh, method is more um, useful, that intracerebral route is feasible for, the, uh, for giving the stem cell into the brain. And this is a, a, a complete clinical trial using stem cell for stroke. There are several stroke uh, clinical trial running in, around the world. And most of the cells are MSC. And the transplantation route is venous, arteri arterial, or direct into the brain. They are all the same. And transplantation date is acute for about 20%, and subacute for 50%, and chronic for 30%. And this is the clinical trial um, currently running in Japan. There are six clinical trials of using stem cells for ischemic stroke in Japan. And we are the Hokkaido University, but others are companies and other universities. As you can see, most of the uh, trials uses MSC. And for traumatic brain injury, um, this is also for MSC. And something new is that for Parkinson's disease and spinal cord injury, there are iPS cells used for uh, is, is currently running. The clinical trial using IPS is currently running. I will briefly introduce our clinical trial using MSC for, a sp uh, for a, a ischemic brain, brain injury. This is called the rainbow trial. The, our main concept is that we use a patient in the subacute ischemic stroke and we develop the cell as an autologous. That means that we take the stem cell from the patient itself. And we transplant the cell using intracerebral transplantation. The trial is funded by government 
And I myself is the principal investigator for this trial. So for up to 14 days, the patient will receive an ordinary um, treatment for a stroke. But after 14, day 14, the patient will be evacu evaluated and we give an informed consent. And as, as soon as the patient uh, accepts to be involved in the clinical trial, we take the bone marrow aspiration from the patient. And the cell culture takes about 30 to 40 days. And we inject the cell to the patient at around two months from the first ischemic stroke. After that, we will have a normal rehabilitation. And after that, the patient will move on to their home. Something new in this trial is that we do not use an animal related product, which is the fetal, fe fetal bovine felum, selum, which means most of the cell is incubated. With the, with the blood of the cow. But this will, this has the uh, demerit of uh, any zoonosis, any um, contamination from the animals. So we use uh, blood, uh, actually a plated lysid, platelet, instead of animal blood. And we inject the cell into the brain using a stereotactic navigation and we track the cell using uh, uh, iron, the spile. Uh, we label the cell in, with the iron so that we can see the cells in the brain, whether they move or whether, whether, they, whether they stay where, at the place where we inject it. This is the all seven patient that we inject the cells. These patients are 52 to 72 years old, four females and three males. And uh, car there are car cardioembolic or atherosclerotic or lacuna patients. All of these patients have very severe disease that modified ranking scale at 14 days from the onset is 4.6. That means that the patient is, does not walk by himself or by him or herself. This is the surgical video of our transplantation. We make a burr hole on the brain. And after that, we receive the cell from the cell processing center. And with this cell, I'm going to suck the cell into the syringe and I will inject the cell into the brain where I use the computer to pre-plan where to inject the cells. And because we label the cells, we can see the cells are transplanted into the place uh, where we uh, planned to inject. So this is the patient. The first patient is a LACNA BAD, had a severe left hemiparesis. We inject the cell to the right coded head. And after that, after that we inject the cell as close as to the uh, brain infarction, but not in the infarction itself. Because if you inject the cell into the brain infarction, the cell will subsequently die because there is no blood or oxygen delivered. So we inject the cell to the closest place where closest place of living brain. So non-damaged and non-eloquent brain was selected for a transplantation site and the near the damaged site, which shows absence of tractography. So with the tractography, we can see that this patient has a discontinued tractography at this point. So we inject the cell as close as possible to that position. And this is the result of the efficacy evaluation because this is a phase one. So we do not have any control patient and it is too early to draw any definite conclusion. But as for this NIHS and Virtho index, we found that an uh, increased uh, incremental change of daily ratio of uh, their, the patient recovery soon after the transplantation of stem cells. And we found that all of, we tried, we transplanted, we transplanted the cells to the seven patient and six patients gained gait recovery after the transplantation. As um, you can see this video, this patient is uh, hemiplegic. So she is completely 
she cannot move her right hand or right leg. But after two years, after transplantation, we found that the patient can walk by herself, completely by herself, and she can also she also regained her functional, the upper uh, extremity functional uh, recovery. So she moved back to her daily life. And one something new in our trial is that cell moves in the brain. We, for this patient, we inject the cell to the right caudate head, but after one year, the cell is gone. However, we found a very strong iron signal around the infarction brain, especially in the inner border of the infarction, which lasted more than two years. And other patient has a severe left uh, ischemic stroke, we inject the cells, the iron signal decreases over time, but in the meanwhile, we found a very strong uh, iron signal at the subventricular, the inner border of the ischemic stroke. And one more thing is that we did a FDG PET and the IMZ SPECT in order to find out why the patient recovered. And we found that a very strong FDG and the ilmazenil IMZ SPECT uh, recovery, uh, recovery after transplantation. But however, this is very, but I have to emphasize that this is a phase one and we do not have a control. So this may be a natural course of the, the recovery of the disease. So I will briefly move on to next trial that we did. Uh, which is this, the traumatic brain injury. Uh, this has been uh, published in, uh, last year um, for the neurology um, with, I, I myself is the principal investigator, uh, the first and the corresponding author for this clinical trial. This is a SP623 developed by a, a Japanese uh, company of using a bone marrow stromal cells. So their concept is that they use the allogenic cells, which means that they develop the cell from other people, other person, and they inject the gene transfection. So they take the bone marrow and expand the cell and they transiently infect the notch one intracellular domain vector, which develop the cell much stronger. And the cell is then uh, cultured, then cryopreserved for the use. So their concept is that they use allogenic cells, which means that it is high volume production and they transfect the gene, which means that they, they improve the quality. And something new is that they cryopreserve the cells, which means that they can storage the cell in long-term. And this st study is multi-centered, randomized, double-blind, sham-operated phase two trials. Sham-operated means that the sham a patient also has a skin cut. They cut, we cut the skin and open a burr hole, but does not inject the cells. So the patient does not, un, does not know this is double blind. So, or actually I myself knows the answer, but the assessor doesn't know. So it's a double blind. And the patient also does not know that he or she has uh, received the cell or not. The, the participating facility is in Japan, United States, and Ukraine. So the patient is chronic motor deficit from traumatic brain injury, more than six months. And they have a severe, a moderate to severe motor deficit related to brain injury on MRI. So the cell number is zero or 2.5 multiple by 10 to six, 5.0, 10.0 multiple by 10 to six. The ratio is one to one to one to one. And the transplantation site is close to the brain injury, but this is, uh, this is uh, doctor's preference. So we can choose where, whether we can choose where to inject the cells. And the assessment is the improvement of fugal myomotor motor scale at six months. So this is also the surgical video that we open, we cut the skin, but as, as you can see, this patient has a severe 
uh, brain damage of acute sub uh, acute subdural hematoma, which requires a surgical evacuation of the bone. So the patient already have a skin uh, wound. So I cut the skin, open the burr hole, and I also inject the cells. I receive the cell from the cell processing center. I mix the cells because the cell sometimes um, gathers and I made a I made a needle and I also inject the cell into the brain using the uh, stereotactic navigation system. Unfortunately, these cells are not labeled, so we're not we are not sure the, the fate of the brain uh, fate of the transplanted cells. And these are the result of the stem cell. We um, we included 211 patients worldwide, but finally we randomized 63 patients, 50 patients for the sham trial, sham, 15 patients for the low dose of, uh, oh, sorry, low dose of 2.5 multiple by 10, five, uh, 15 patients with five multiple by 10 to six, uh, six patients with 10 multiple by 10 to six, and 50 patients with sham surgery. So I, I once again say that the sham surgery also has a skin cut, and also I make a burr hole, but still I do not inject the cell into the brain. And this is the result of the trial. The, the, the patient does not receive the cell is, is, is set as control. And the patient who received the cell, e either they're low dose, middle dose, or high dose, they are gathered as a, stem, uh, as a SP623 pooled. As you can see, <clears throat> the, the change of baseline of the Fugelmeyer recovery, there was a significant difference of recovery of uh, Fugelmeyer motor scale uh, in the transplanted cell groups, and which was P equal 0 0.06 and statistically significant. And as you can see, there was a, there was a very diff diff difference of uh, cell dosage the, this is the, few, the, um, the response rate of Fugelmeyer motor scale. As this is a sham surgery, uh, the percent of patient with clinically meaningful improvement of Fugelmeyer, which means that the Fugelmeyer motor scale improved more than 10 points. So only 6.7% patient, of patient recover more than 10%. Uh, more than 10 points in Fugelmeyer motor scale. However, uh, the patient who received 2.5, there's a 20%. And the patient received 5.0 multiple by 10 to 6, recovered 50%. And 10 to 10, 10 multiple by 10 to 6, recovered 43%. So we found a very good uh, motor functional recovery with the patient who received more than five multiple by 10 to six cells in the brain. And this is once again, the, uh, the change of motor function. Uh, and this is the five points, five multiple by 10 to six cells that these, the patient who received this amount of cell is showed a significant recovery compared with the control patient who received zero cells. And this is a time course and the change of Fugelmeyer motor scale. And the, the, the y-axis is the change from the baseline. And the 10 point, more than 10, means the meaningful changes. And the x-axis is the time since injury. As you can see for this, oh, and the blue means the patient who received the cell. And the red means that the patient did not receive the cells. As you can see for this patient, this patient already had uh, 240 months, which means this patient already had 20 years of injury, but still showed a significant uh, motor functional recovery after 20 years of injury. So uh, this is a, I think this is a very good uh, result that, to show that 
even in the chronic phase that we can, uh, if we can even help the patient recover, help the patient to recover their motor functional deficit. And these are other uh, neurological deficit uh, scoring. Uh, most of them are uh, statistically significant as the, the pooled group are better than the control group. This is a gate velocity. This is a neuro QOL. So what we learn from this phase 2b clinical trial is that the motor deficit from chronic brain injury, from a traumatic brain injury, can be ameliorated by stem cell transplantation theory. However, what is left is that where would be the best spot to transplant the cells? These are the patients that I, I actually transplanted the cells in the clinical trials but every patient is different and it's very dif difficult and it is unknown that where is the best spot to inject a cell for this patient or, uh, or this patient. It's very difficult. And I speak with the, the caregiver of the, the patient that they say, is there any benefit for the cognitive functions? Because traumatic brain injury patients often uh, claims a cognitive functions. And we're not currently sure that this work, that our, our trial, our stem cell can also recover their cognitive functions. And can and what type of rehabilitation boost the recovery? We're also not sure that we're, we're currently sure that the stem cell uh, transplantation itself is insufficient that there must be a rehabilitation to boost the recovery, but we're not sure what type of recovery, reco rehabilitation is best. But what is expected is that this cell is except, except, expected to be approved in Japan within a year. So, uh, and is got, it, it is going to be covered by a Japanese uh, governmental health insurance. So we are hoping that this new era of neural regeneration is coming soon. And I've, I've talked with this company that they're trying to develop these cells also in Asia, because there are so many patients in Asia su suffering traumatic brain injury. So summary of clinical trials, we report our phase one clinical trial using BMSC of Autologous, the patient's BMSC for intracerebral injection against patient with subacute ischemic stroke. And allogenic, this is a phase one, and allogenic gene transferred MSC transplantation against patient with chronic traumatic brain injury. This is a phase 2B. Although there are several unsolved questions, stem cell therapy will be launched in neurological field soon. So I, I thank you for your attention. And there is a new era coming to regenerate the brain using stem cells. Well, thank you very much. Shinjan, kindly unmute okay. your mic. Yeah, Dr. Kawa, Kawa Bori's uh, uh, speech is uh, excellent. I think uh, it's uh, related to the uh, subacute uh, uh, stroke and uh, also the all brain injury therapy by using the uh, autologous or uh, allogenic MSCs uh, direct injected into the brain. So question is uh, where is the best site for brain injection and uh, how uh, many uh, cells or volume of the uh, these uh, cells to be injected uh, in each site? And uh, uh, whether uh, rehab has, uh, can have some beneficial effect on the uh, uh, post uh, transplant uh, recovery. And I also, uh, we uh, here in Taiwan, I'm the, the only person that perform uh, the uh, cell therapy injected uh, like you using the stereotactic surgery. Uh, inject into the brain. Uh, what we we've been inject uh, for uh, stroke patient. We oh, we 
uh, injected into the chronic stroke patient. Those who uh, had uh, stroke, uh, infection stroke beyond six months up to one, five years, 15 years uh, all, uh, were all included. And at the uh, 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 10 years before, we uh, using a patient's uh, uh, autologous uh, CD34 positive stem cells. So we took the uh, uh, CD34 positive uh, stem cell from patients on uh, peripheral blood and uh, uh, labeled with ion, green max ions, and then inject into uh, the uh, the uh, infection brain. And the mainly I aimed to the uh, pyramidal tract, the injured pyramidal tract. Uh, one injection, uh, be, uh, like the uh, above, if you see from the top, above the lesion, and the one just around, uh, just beneath the lesion at the same level, and the one just uh, beneath, uh, which means uh, uh, more near the uh, stem, uh, brain stem site. So I uh, inject three sites, uh, but all along the pyramidal tract, injured pyramidal tract, uh, she, uh, we can, uh, whether we can reconstruct the damaged uh, pyramidal tract to help patient uh, motor uh, functional regains. I think uh, uh, it's pretty much uh, different from yours in the sub, uh, uh, acute chronic, uh, subacute uh, stroke. And then now uh, we use the uh, autologous patient's uh, adipose tissue, uh, ADAC, adipose tissue derived stem cells, which uh, were all uh, culture expanded. So the amount of the cells we inject uh, into the uh, each brain, uh, it's around uh, 10 to the eighth. So it's uh, much more, uh, almost 1,000 fold uh, 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 larger or, uh, or more uh, than yours. And uh, all these patients, again, the chronic stroke patient. Now uh, we are using the partial programmed uh, stem cell which uh, not uh, un unlike the iPS cells uh, have the chance to become the tumor, but uh, they uh, are much more powerful than the simple MSCs. So it's partial programs, means uh, these stem cell uh, can express like analog genes so that uh, they can have the much more uh, powerful to uh, migration, to proliferation, to promote angiogenesis and neurogenesis. So now, it, which is currently uh, we use uh, in uh, uh, shock uh, patient therapies. I also tried uh, to inject uh, MSCs uh, for motor neuron disease into their brain and also for uh, cerebellar uh, degeneration patients, but into the uh, cerebral peduncle, cerebellar peduncle, the, 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 uh, the cerebellum. Yeah. So that, that's what uh, I inject here. I think more than uh, 40, 45 patients uh, I, I've ever injected, but all these are phase two, uh, 2A, uh, not yet 2B. So uh, I congratulate your, uh, uh, your result that uh, for head trauma patients, it's really useful. I think to be uh, the trial are very uh, beautiful. And uh, uh, there's uh, uh, almost a, a dose, uh, in the dose dependent recovery uh, to the 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. But for uh, the uh, uh, shock patients, I think uh, uh, you may move to the uh, 2B very fast. So congratulations. And the site I uh, recommend is first, uh, the, uh, the pyramidal tract first. Yeah. So I think 
you beautiful beauty body demonstrate that the injected stem cells can move and the fast body may uh, proliferate uh, differentiation proliferation uh, in the brain uh, i think it may uh, like uh, we published a paper on the journal neurosurgery like yours uh, we saw uh, these uh, after implantation of stem cell they have the angiogenesis function. They also follow by uh, follow uh, with uh, neurogenesis function in the brain injury, uh, whether it's a trauma or uh, infected brains. So congratulations. So we uh, now I, uh, on the uh, line, uh, there's uh, may uh, lots of the experts to have questions with you, uh, please. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Uh, Kawabori and Professor uh, Shinjong Ling for this wonderful session. We learned a lot from you both today. If there are any questions, I would like to open this for discussion. Yes, my co-host Dr. Liu Bun Seng. Any questions from you? Thanks, Raja. Thanks, Professor, for a very nice presentation. Uh, may I ask two questions, Professor? Regarding the stroke patient, uh, may I know uh, that do you have ever performed a functional MRI? to show that the motor improvement area are the same area with the stem cell area which you tag. My first question, rather than uh, using the PET scan. My second question, Professor, in the traumatic brain injury, you show that uh, in the treated with stem cell, there's a maximum improvement within two years, but, but however, there's mild declination uh, while the control group is still improving. And uh, with, at, at four years, its uh, p-value is at 0 0.04. And do you foresee that if you follow up longer with these two groups, uh, we have the same improvement? Thank you, Professor. Well, thank you very much. So first uh, question is that, uh, uh, what was that? The first, <laughs> first one is the- Functional MRI, using functional, uh, functional MRI. Sorry about that. Uh, actually, we did not do functional MRI for the patient, but we found a very good uh, FDG PET and the SPECT, uh, IMZ SPECT, and the movement of the cells. So where the cell moved, the place where the cell moved caused the upregulation of FDG and IMZ SPECT. So we, we thought that some of the cell migration migrated to the, uh, a certain place uh, actually uh, stayed in that place and caused a glucose metabolism and uh, caused a synaptic uh, functions. So that's the first great, first answer. And for the traumatic brain injury, uh, what was it? Um, yeah, there, there is an improvement uh, up to two years, but there's slight declination. So will you see that beyond four years, uh, both we have same improvement? Uh, this is a clinical trial. And for myself, I, I follow all my patients who I inject the cells. And the patient who inject the cells continuously uh, regain their function. For, but for the control patient, they go like this, but soon reached plateau. So I think their difference is still um, increasing. Thank you, Professor. But af at, after two, uh, 1.5 years, we told the patient that you are sham, or actually you received the cells. So after that, uh, the patient, it, the, the blindness is gone. So the patient knows that he did not receive the cell, he or she did not receive the cells. So after that, it's not scientifically correct to, uh, to, to examine their results. Would, would, would you think that by letting the patient know they are in, in the treatment group that we encourage them to be improved further in their mental to do a physiotherapy? Do you think that we have effect? Um, actually, um, I don't think so. Um, at that time, the patient has already good function. And actually, for the patient with a sham group, we are saying that we will inject the cell for, the free, for free of cost after approvement of the government. So we, we also give the cells after uh, this approvement next year. We will give the patient, uh, sham patient, uh, of transplanting, we are transplanting the cell to those patients maybe next year. Yes, it's a crossover study. It's very mm. good. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much. Uh, there is one question which is in the chat box and uh, Dr. Ayman Ali Mayas wants to ask, ask how to make sure this effect of transplantation or time spontaneous improvement. Thank you very much for the uh, subacute phase. This phase one, we have no idea. We, we, we cannot guarantee that this is the, the, the power of stem cells. So we have, we, what we can say is that the transplantation, transplantating the cell is safe. That's only we can say for the phase one trial. But phase two B is that we can say that this is a control, this is a complete double blind so we can say that this is not a natural course. It, it's the cell that that caused or that that improves the patient's uh, recovery. So if we want to show, we have to move on to phase two, phase three, uh, in order to show that the cell and uh, doing the double blind study in order to show the completeness of our trial. Well, thank you very much. We had a wonderful session listening to you. And I would like to mention to our viewers that this has been broadcast on WeChat, YouTube, and Zoom. And as of now, we have around 630 people who have joined us live on all three platforms. So thank you, Professor Shubin, for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. With that, we come to the end of the first session. If Professor Shinchon Ling and Professor Kavari would be staying back for the second session, or you would be leaving? Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, uh, it's an excellent speech, and I think uh, this is a very uh, good organization from the ACNS uh, societies. Thank you so much. I uh, learned a lot from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, I would like to invite our second chair, Professor Yusuke Nishimura, for a brief introduction and invite Professor Pestonji for his lecture. Professor Nishimura. Okay, thank you. So, hello everyone. My name is Yusuke Nishimura. I'm belonging to Naga University, Japan, and uh, I'm a program director of the Naga University's Neurospine program. So, I'm very honored and very happy to chair this great session. And we have Professor Malcolm Bestonji as a speaker of a second lecture, who is giving a lecture entitled Endoscopic Spinal Fusion in Awake, Aware, Anesthesia. Actually, I have never done the spinal fusion surgery for a weak patient by myself, and I'm looking forward to listening to the, this amazing lecture. Professor Marco Peston, please study a lecture. Uh, we're talking about endoscopic spine fusion, and there are two forms of endoscopic spine fusions which uh, I have particularly helped develop. One is the transcambin lumbar interbody fusion, and the second is EUB endoscopic T-lip surgery, and uh, somehow for a certain set of patients, it's very important to do these surgeries and they're awake and aware anesthesia. So the question is why? Awake and aware anesthesia is very safe uh, to both the patient and the operating surgeon. For elderly patients with comorbidities, especially patients with cardiac failure, poor cardiac output, chest problems, patients with severe asthmatic uh, problems, and you put them under general anesthesia, however safe it is, despite the advent of new gases like sevoflurane, you wake up in the ICU, struggling with a tube, and uh, they take time to come out. Neuromonitoring is just not required because the patient is doing his or her own neuromonitoring. Patient moving his or her own limbs at your command. And uh, then comes the other worry that we always face is, will I get adequate drop in blood pressure? Yes. Today, blood pressure control can be easily achieved by using drugs like nitroglycerin or NTG pumps, dexmedine, which is a, a sedative kind of drug, also drops the blood pressure adequately. So you can use these medicines to control the blood pressure. Addition of these sedatives also keeps the patient comfortable for a period of three to four hours. So for a single level or a double level fusion, it is very comfortable to do this. Now, very important is patient's response to heat. The moment I use a plasma probe and I go near a root, the patient will twitch. The patient will complain of burning pain. The patient will complain that there is something feeling warm in his leg. Now, these are a very big bite to me, especially when I don't know where something is and I'm searching for it. Uh, lastly, that 
what I do is I achieve a partial motor block, but I have a deep sensory block. So the patient is nicely aware, awake, arousable at all times. And that's how we proceed. I'll just play this little video. Oh, yes, very nice. Move your legs. Right, left, both. Very good, short. Now we will talk about transcambian lumbar antibody fusion. This was a lumbar antibody fusion, which I started way back in 2018. And uh, it has a certain set of advantages and a certain set of disadvantages. Now, what are the advantages? It's basically, I do it with facet preservation. I do not touch the facets. I do not even do a foraminotomy. I do not do a foraminoplasty. I gradually dilate, dilate, dilate until I'm able to achieve a cage size of 10, 11, or 12 millimeters. I preserve both the facets at any cost. Cage insertion is completely done under local anesthesia with the sensory epidural. So that at the point of putting in my needle, at the time of putting in my guide wire, I'm absolutely sure under local anesthesia that I'm not hit any neural element. The sensory top up or the partial sensory motor block, sensory epidural block, that comes subsequently. Patient is doing his or her own neuromodulation, what we spoke of. This surgery is less than 50 cc blood loss in the entire surgery. And you have a visualized preparation of end plates. The end plates can be curated, cleaned, and absolutely preserved. You do not accidentally do more decortication of the end plates. There has been a zero case of incidental durotomy or root tears. I've had zero incidence of even a foot drop or a partial motor loss following this. Why? Because the patient is awake and aware. And the moment you go near a root or you pass pressure on the root, the patient will cry out with pain. Ideal for elderly patients with multiple comorbidities, what I explained to you before, but the disadvantages. Now coming to the disadvantages, Calif is again an indirect decomposition. It's quite like OLIF. Olive is anterior to SWAS and posterior to the SWAS. It cannot resolve central canal stenosis. It cannot help me with fascicle cysts. It cannot help me with ossified ligamentum flavum. It cannot be done in old redo surgeries. Now, this is a very moot point where I suspect a lot of plastering of the dura has already occurred to the floor of the canal or to the pedicles. A severe root entrapment is expected and you can't directly just stretch out something because that could then be a disaster zone. Yes, expensive infrastructure endoscopy is definitely a little more expensive. And there is a need for endoscopic training. And as you go over that curve and over that bend, it becomes very easy. I will now play a small video and please listen to it. Good morning. Welcome to Golden Park Operation Theater, Endospine Suite. Today we are doing a case of transforaminal endoscopic spine fixation. We'll be introducing the cage through the foramen without violating the facet. And we'll be doing minimally invasive posterior screw fixation with reduction of a patient of degenerative listosis, as you see over here. The L5 has moved ahead on the S1. There is collapse of disc height. And we can see that in extension, there is partial reduction of this, but in a flexion view, we can see that it's a grade one to grade two listosis. Now, if you see here in the MRI, you can see there's a huge broad base disc bulge because of the listosis. It's a very tight foramen. Bilaterally, the patient is having severe claudication. There are red facets that are observed, thickening of ligament flavum, but basically the uh, sac size is quite capacious, so I feel that by getting a good distal height, transforaminally and minimally invasive fixation, and debulking this posterior distal surface uh, through an inside-out approach, we will be able to restore this spine to its normalcy. This surgery is basically being done under local anesthesia, where the entire cage will be inserted under local anesthesia to the patient. And subsequently, after patient is given a sensory epidural, we will be putting in with local aided four minimally invasive screws. The top two screws will be reduction screws, and uh, we should be able to fix up her spine.
with the cage loaded with bone graft and dilate crest. And uh, hopefully she should be on her way to recovery. So thank you very much. Let's hope we get a good result today. This is a small video of preparation of the graft. We are curating the end plate. Okay. Make sure that the graft that we put in through the cage has a good chance of union. Can you please bring the Siam in front, Mr. John? And now we'll be taking a live shoot. And Shirley is going to focus on the screen. In front of the screen, please, Shirley. Yes. Give me a live shoot, please. Continuous. Yes, thank you. And as you can see, continuously shoot. Here now, John, please. And as you can see, we are now curating and creating entire space inside. One minute, please hold steady now. No, don't shoot now. One minute. Shoot, please, John. Completion of end plate preparation. This is the superior end plate which has been stripped and prepared. Now I'm rotating the tube to expose the end plate preparation of the S1 vertebrae. So both the surfaces are now prepared and are ready. You see the cage, there are a few loose fragments which have been pulled out, flushed out, and we are ready to place our cage. I will now be inserting the cage and you will see the patient is wide awake. This is a modified cannula. It has got an enlarged tank that allows me to put in the cage loaded with graft. Sure. As the cage enters the foramen, legs, before I pass it through the foramen, we wake her up. Yeah. She's being asked in our local language to explain and she says I have no pain. Now the cage is moved into the L5S1 this space and coming from above the iliac crest. She has any pain, ask her please. You can tell her that she is in the face. 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 We will now confirm an AP and lateral whether the cage is properly placed. Now I'm now you can see me that I'm coming from the opposite portal. I'm coming from the opposite side. I'm above the cage. And I'm removing all the discal material that is posterior to the cage on the opposite side. So the entire annulus is now empty. There is no nuclear material retained. I'm seeing both the end plates. I'm seeing the titanium plates from the opposite side. So that makes me very comfortable with what I'm doing. So bipartal endoscopy insertion of cage through one of the filaments. And coming to our experience, what has been my experience? My experience has been in degenerative retrolysthesis, in lysis lysthesis, in severe canal stenosis patients, lateral canal, I'm using the word here, lateral canal. Now here you see a patient with a L45 degenerative lysis lysthesis. You can see the four in screw insertion marks on the back. And you can see the uh, from where we have inserted the cage. This is the image going back to 16th of September 2019, where we have introduced a cage and done a reduction at L45. The cage is nice and horizontal because the approach is more horizontal. This is a case of a grade three lysis lysthesis where again you see that we have come in from above the sacral uh, ala 
we have entered the foramen we have carried out a reduction and here yeah, the cage is in place all four screws and rods are in place so it's a trans combin interlumbar fusion all these fusions are done under awake aware anesthesia now we spoke of trans combin into body fusions but there were problems with it what were the problems with it basic problem that was there with it was that i was not able to solve the problems of posterior pathologies severe stenosis i could not solve facetal cyst associated i could not solve what happened when there was bilateral severe foraminal stenosis operating of sap i felt that i might i need to decompress both the foramen so i shifted to or i joined the fusion bandwagon at ub endotelif what is the advantage of ub endotelif it allows visualization of the dural edge and nerve put in its entire path it is beautiful for associated central canal stenosis facetal cysts and other pathologies ideal for redo explorations where there is entrapment of the root and you expect even the dura to be plastered to the body it is easier for a traditional spine surgeon to do because he is anatomically more adapted to it a much larger cage size can be easily introduced and autologous bone from the spinous process can be harvested lamina can be harvested and the ipsilateral facet on the opposite side you are undercutting you are doing a sublaminar decompression you are doing a what in now aoc nomenclature is called as icelf that is uh, laminar uh, endoscopic interlaminar contralateral uh, ventral facetectomy the disadvantage is yes sometimes you need general anesthesia can't be avoided but try to do it under epidural the possibility of a root tear injury yes it has happened to two of my patients and i had to repair the root tear i had to do endoscopic suturing of that small rent patient did have a little bit of root irritation for a couple of months before going on to proper recovery blood loss definitely is much more than in trans cambin interbody fusions so those are the disadvantages uh i'll just play this video uh, you can see a thick cage that is been put in you can see the root over here this is the exiting root on my side this is the traversing root which is now exiting from here at this pedicle and i still retain most of the flavor the compression i'll be doing of the flavor later so i call it as extra flavor decompression wherein we have even gone further where we now don't even see the neural elements we go so laterally we go x lif so without touching the flavor without even seeing the dura uh, we are able to put in a cage do the complete decompression later do the flavectomy later so you have less blood loss you can use higher fluid pressures and you can achieve all that you wish to you can see in this patient of degenerative retinal lysthesis it's a grade 1 to grade 2 lysthesis we have done a fusion and i have done a unilateral fixation but that is a different story it's a different series we'll talk about it later here you see a severe disc prolapse bilateral foraminal stenosis in this patient and uh, i'll just show you her video i played one video first but i'll play the second oh. video okay yes very nice so she's quite a young girl with severe stenosis prolapse move your legs okay. right so you can see me putting in the screws and in very good shot now i'm in the desk i'm preparing the end plates and you can see that the patient is completely awake throughout the surgery now what do i do i introduce an epidural at l23 if i wish to operate at 3445 or 5s1 the epidural is directed downwards i use ropivacaine in a mixture of 5 ml of 0.75% and 5 ml of 
2.5%. This mixture gives me an average mix of around 4, 4.5%. And that gives me an adequate deep sensory partial motor block, allowing the patient to be absolutely comfortable throughout the surgery. During giving of top-ups, a repeat top-up at one, one and a half hours when the epidural has to be repeated, that is the time that the quotient of the 2.5 ml, I increase and I drop the quotient of 7.5%. The reason is I want the patient to be in a lighter plane of epidural anesthesia, moving her limbs more comfortably so that I can track and monitor her well. I augment it by using dexmedrine, fentanyl, and blood pressure I control by using an NTG pump. Here you can see a video of the cage being inserted. The cage is loaded with graph. The graph is already been packed in front. And we are placing the graph well. See in this patient, this patient has severe stenosis and collapsed disc at L5S1. You can see that we have achieved good disc height and good reduction. When pathology's level is multiple and you need to do it, yes, you can do it. You can do it at two levels, three levels. Choice is yours. Unlike an open surgery and you fix from T1 downwards, no, I don't do that. That, that by UB, I haven't done it yet. I haven't ventured into scoliosis or deformity corrections. That's not my fault. But endoscopically, yes. Percutaneous screws, yes. Fixation, I've done a larger series in the world, maybe today of 84 patients. They are under observation right now. Up till now, I had zero implant failure or pack out, slipping of cage. And most of them are shifting towards union. So that has been the good part of it, but I'm waiting for the final results before I publish. We are just at about one year now, and we are waiting for another six months to get the final data before we publish that. For redo spine surgeries, why endotelif is my favorite is because when there is a root or a dural sac which is plastered, severe collapse has already occurred because of a previous evacuation of the entire discal material. How do you visualize the entire nerve root? Do you want to see the entire nerve root coming out right from dural sac to outside the SAP? You want to make sure there is no adhesion anyway. You want to make sure that the dural sac will not, I mean, a patient should not wake up crying with pain. So I, here I cannot do a calif. I prefer to do a UB calif. What I've done here is I'm on both sides of the facet. Endoscopic calif, especially and now in I'm current cutting the facet from outside to inside. Where one can identify the facet, osteotomize it completely, push away the dural sac with all its adherent tissues, then identify the root which is completely plastered. Now here you see here the dural sac and the, the root and completely the stuck. Root and identifying the discal surface, I, which I can barely just, a millimeter across. Just about enter the disc. Getting into the discal zone and pushing away the root which is plastered to it completely. Now, this would not be possible by a transcambin approach. We are in the axilla. It would result in unnecessary traction on the root at the time of Over its here is the by a cage. So, every procedure has its pluses and every procedure has its minuses. Here you can see the dissector making space and you can see the root which is plastered completely to the superior surface of the discal space. As a matter of in fact, as I come laterally with the dissector, I find bone covering the root. And therefore, here I will have to osteotomize that bone which is covering this bone the root, will have to be for the lateral extension of the root. Slowly I'm probing away, slowly I'm pushing away the root from the discal surface. Now you will see the osteotomization of the bony tissue covering the root. This is the traversing root, which is so badly plastered. To make sure that the root is entirely free prior to placement of a cage. So, endotelif via UBE 
holds a distinctive advantage as far as the recurrent cases are concerned, where one does not know the level of pathology, adherence of tissues within. Here you can see how I'm osteotomizing with the dissector and gently pushing away the bone, removing the bone which is on the root. This is the traditional part of the surgery where you put in a sizer, dilator, and uh, subsequently use a rotating curette. How do I do it? In you trans in the redo surgeries, especially, there are three ways to do it. One is that you land on the isthmus just below the pedicle, go in, find the old flavum, and then descend downwards along the old path, pushing away the dura and going around the pedicle and finding the root. The second option is you land on the facet or whatever is of the old facet is left after a laminectomy and you go within the facet, within the IAP, SAP. You go inside the facet and you start burring and eating up the facet from both sides until a shell of bone remains on the dural surface and you can burr out, burr out until you remove the entire facet. The third option that I have is I land on the transverse process. From there, I go onto the vertebral body and then descend down into the foramen so that it becomes like a semi-para UV approach, then osteotomize the SAP away and then go down to the floor of the disc, then cut upwards on the remainder of the facet to open up the entire length of the root. So, it's basically the same thing, but it's just that you need to take an on-table option as to how we are going to remove this facet so that everything that is plastered can be easily relieved. Patient can be relieved of her pain and the fusion process can be done properly. In such cases, I do not waste time on autologous graft harvesting. I just depend upon graft from the ileic crest because that as it is, you're working with all plastered neural elements, a lot of bleeding, and you don't want under any circumstances to be worrying about the quality of the graft that you're harvesting. Here is a case where you can see a old laminectomy of a person, somebody has done a laminectomy at L4, L5, and S1. The lamina is missing in between. I have done a redo surgery, I've put in a two level cage and I have done a unilateral fixation. This patient is also doing excellent. These are the scars on the patient's back post surgery. And this is an elderly man. Yeah, we are doing this. The father of an anesthetist. He was so eager to move his limbs. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, his age was 81 when I operated yes, him, and it's about two years now, so he's 82. This is the same patient. You can see that he had a large disc, thick flavum, bilateral foraminal obstruction. Height had to be achieved, cage had to be put in, fixation had to be carried out, and a wide decompression was necessary. So here you see the cage having gone in. You can see how the scope is aligned with the inserter so that the scope is looking down and you're able to top and view everything that you're doing. And that is the fixation final achieved. Here you can see a patient with almost grade two to grade three instability. And the same procedure has been carried out in this patient. Complete reduction has been achieved of a high grade slip. I will play this video. As a matter of fact, I'll be playing. Welcome to a presentation of unilateral bipodal endoscopic transfacetal lumbar interbody fusion at L45 and decompression being done at L5S1, especially targeting the left L5 S1 foramen to free the passage of a trapped nerve root over there. So you can see now 
in the MRI. Patient has a large disc herniation along with severe canal stenosis at L45. Here we are introducing the cage, which is an 11 by 28 mm long T lift cage between the two bones at L4 and L5. The cage is loaded with bone graft. We are now hammering it in place. This is the point where I start angulating it so that it goes more horizontal, reaches the center. The seating of the final seating of the cage is being carried out. And you can see a sliver of the nerve root. A remnant discal tissue being removed. You can see the well placed cage within the this space. The advantage of going laterally is that I don't really need to retract the spinal cord at all. I don't need a retractor on the root. I don't need a retractor on the traversing the over it. I will jump the video a little and bit. The edge of the foramen. And this is on the opposite side. You can see that if you now expose the SAP. On the opposite side. A two mm and curved round here. I'll be opening up the opposite foramen. I'm using a curved round here over there. I'm in the opposite foramen, foramen across the spinal cord. I've already I'm done a sub minor decompression. Now, why am I doing this? Is because I want to increase the cut in the IAP and on the particular pillar so that when I remove the SAP, which is enlarged and large, I can move it into the canal. If I do not make a slightly bigger Going opening in the IAP, the superior I will not be able edge. to shift the SAP in. Yes, this is going outside the foramen and taking a bite. This is a bite Jump into the IAP. I repeat, it's in the IAP. I'm enlarging the, the IAP. To make the exiting path for the exiting route a little bigger. Now I've introduced an osteotome, a J-shaped curved osteotome. This is the I placed it on the IAP. SAP. This is the you SAP. The SAP. You can see the joint bone, and you can see the IAP. I am cutting and osteotomizing only the SAP right now. And as we osteotomize the SAP, we pull it in through a maneuver. Yes, we have fractured and pulled in the tip of the SAP. And now we will be extracting that fragment. You can see the facetal cartilage over here. You can see that I've cut and moved the entire SAP into the canal. And now I'll be removing the, across the, the SAP. spinal cord, which is below us. Now above it and out. And here you can see the exiting root. You can see the pulsating root the fat around the root. The cartilage of the facet joint and the IAP. We have created a large amount of space for the exiting nerve root, which is below, which I'm probing now. 
and we need to remove some of this flavor from here and from near where we did the circumferential opening up of the inferior edge of the superior pedicle. There's a tag of flavor which needs to be cut so that it doesn't compress the root. This is part of what we call as the foraminal ligament, the lateral extension of the flavor. We will be releasing that to release the pressure on the nerve root. So it's not only the bony part which causes compression, it's also this kind of a tight flavorful structure also called as a guillotine ligament of the foramen, which needs to be freed to completely relieve the nerve root of all compression. There's a lot of flavor over there, which is superior and above the nerve root and which we need to remove slowly. So we are using punches which are normally used in arthroscopy. And here you can see a pulsating, beautiful root, completely exposed. Which I intend to release. As you can see, despite teasing it, it is not easily thick. Now, one can see the full length of the pulsatile pulsat root below. Across the spinal cord, we are working now. And we have opened up the opposite foramen nicely and completely. This is a special J shaped probe which reaches those hard to reach corners for coagulation and ablation of flavored tissue. helps expose the nerve root. One can see a nice pulsatile, pulsatile nerve root going out through the foramen, adequate space being created. Here you can see our post-operative result. We have put in particular screws only on one side to lock in the cage. I will now play the next video. This, this is an extra flavor surgery where I do the entire yes, surgery, right. extra flavor. Today I'm going to discuss decompression, the fixation, fusion, and the flavectomy is done as a last the step in the whole surgery. You can see the listhesis in this case, instability, to, uh, and severe stenosis. You can see the pathology from the MRI. The this is the end plate which we have prepared. In front of you. End plate preparation has been completed almost. It's Last a visualized end plate preparation. The scope is within the disc. I can see right across. I can see at the roof. I can see opposite side. I can see my own side by rotating just the scope camera head. But how does this endothelium differ from the rest? This differs from the rest. 
by the very fact that we have not exposed the dura at all. Where's the dura? You can't see the dura. It's in the flavor. It's completely protected. It's protected by the flavor. We are lateral to the dura. It's an excellent. for grafting. This tube is loaded with graft and which we have harvested from the lamina spinous process and a small part for one centimeter part of the ilex crest also. So that I have more than adequate work. Which you, you can, you can see. see the pillar, you can see the column, which you can see the pedicle over here. Thing. You can see the vertebral body over here. But you can't see the neural and elements. See the neural elements are completely protected. And the graft is packed nicely anteriorly. I'm emptying out the tube of all the graft that's been filled in it. You can see the pillar of the pedicle. In the corner, you can even see the small amount of the exiting root. And as I come out, again, reposition my scope to be able to see very clearly the graft which is packed inside. It's completely it's packed with packed. graft. At no point, nowhere is the dura exposed. Everything is nice. Even the exiting nerve root is barely visualized, is protected by the phlegm that okay. covers it during its journey through the foramen. Exiting root I've is done here. a complete facetectomy. I am a good two centimeters outside the dural surface. I'm introducing a 12 millimeter thick, huge cage of titanium loaded with bone graft. Unfortunately, this patient is from a very economically poor zone and we had to compromise on using a titanium cage. It's a 24 millimeter cage by a 12 millimeter cage. And having entered and engaged the cage, now starts the descent, the inward journey of the cage into the disc between the two vertebral surfaces. But this The flavor is covering it completely. And now I'm taking a shoot to verify the position the cage behind, checking the position of the cage. Any free bone fragments will be removed. Let us push the cage in. I feel that one long, big cage is more than enough, though there are surgeons who prefer dual caging. That is basically, I don't know. What we are doing now is using a flip rod to make the cage horizontal and push it anteriorly. Here you can see the tongue of the flip rod engaging the cage. And as we start hammering the cage in, the cage will go a little more anteriorly, but it will become more horizontal. And as the flip rod descends into the disc, engaging the cage, I'm quite sure now the cage is absolutely horizontal. And it has been pushed deeply inside. The bone graft is completely locked in. You can see the red bleeding surfaces of the bone. Some amount of oozing from the bone is bound to happen because you've removed the end plates. Cartilage of the end plates, not the end plates. And made the end plates raw and bleeding. And now, very confident that we can now progress to the next stage of the surgery. And that next stage of surgery is going to be the flavectum. We are going to open the flavor to finish the decompression. We have done all our pony work prior to doing the UB fixation. 
prior to preparing the plates. And we are now going to slowly start with the It has taken me four bites with a two millimeter punch to even reach the edge of the flavor. So the flavor was quite far away. We were far away. The dural edge was far away. And through an X lift position, one can very easily put in a cage without having to expose the neural elements and suffer accidental dural tears, durotomies, or even excessive retraction of the neural elements. So we have done a tea leaf in its true sense. You can appreciate on this CM images, the fixation now in AP and a lateral plane. I thank you very much for your kind attention. In the last few Good morning, dear friends. Today we are dealing with a patient, a young girl, severe stenosis of the root. You can see an upriding SAP and a very small entrance of the root. There is either a foraminal disc or a foraminal band. You can see in the axial a small bulge, but there is degeneration at the L5S1 segment and basic collapse. I decided to do a TLF and here as you can see, as I coming out laterally and sweeping along the SAP which I have drilled, I see a huge yellow hard band. What I suspected in the beginning, that is the extra foraminal compression where the back chops ligament, also known as the Wilson's ligament. And you can see how thick it is. My plasma wand is almost two and a half millimeters thick. And yet I'm cutting away a large amount of this tissue. It is hard, it shows calcification, and it is sweeping and extending right outside the SAP. This is the SAP. It is coming yeah. out of the foramen. It is completely pressing and crushing this nerve root. I'm not able to see this nerve root, which normally I would be able to see quite freely. This is the cut SAP, but this ligament In extends out. <laughs> this is the thoracic transverse part of the ilo lumbar ligament. But we also call it a cool RF wand because it emits a very low temperature when fired at low volumes of current. And you can see how it ablates and dissolves away even this hard tissue. But you can see that calcification in it. This is the SAP pillar. And now I'm going towards the IAP. This is the undersurface Here I am at of the, the IAP. SAP, IAP rather, undersurface, burning away the cartilage and the synovium, trying to expose the surface of the SAP, which is gone right up. I'm still not able to see it. You can see this yellow ligament extending there. But that is not the flavum, I can assure you. The flavum is on the root, which is below this. You can even see the distal surface now, the column, the pedicle. I am putting a dissector, pushing it hard in to delineate the SCP stick. And you can see a little amount of root fat around there, just below that tip. So we need to cut open that tip slowly. Now we can see the tip of the SAP being cut away and the epidural fat on the low root.
you can also see the yellow ligament, or the back chops ligament. Because I'm dissecting away laterally, cutting away the SAP tip with a two millimeter keratin punch. I find the going difficult. From above is this hard ligament, below is the pulsating root. I'm now using a chisel, flat surface turned towards the bone. Because I'm not able to undercut anymore. It shows the inadequacy of what we do in standard procedures. And we just try to put a garrison into the foramen and try to underbite. That is not adequate, gentlemen. I'm removing these chips of bone to be used as graft along with the other graft that we have harvested from the IAP from the base of the spinous process, the lamina itself. And I have some graft also from the anterior eye like crest. Yeah, I'm burning away the edge of the SAP. Finish the... Finishing touches to the tip of the SAP. There is no way I can go more cranially because there is a root over there. You can see the discal surface which is now being exposed. But you can see that by osteotomizing the SAP, undercutting it. But a lot of this tissue. You can see the entire root, the entire root is starting from root. here, going right it out. Needs to be cut. But this this ligament I'm is cutting, cutting down. This is part of the alveolum ligament. That part that comes from the base is the transverse process, the body, and which attaches to the anterior sacral surface, dividing the L5 foramen into two parts and pressing down on the ventral part, pressing down on the primary motor nerve root, and causing severe pain. Like this anterior division, which is being crushed by this ligament as it sweeps out on the outer surface of the SAP, and you can still see a tip of the SAP osteotomy is still lying there. That is what I'm detaching here. You can see a tip of the SAP which I had osteotomized. Have to remove that also, and you can see how big it is. And now we freed the entire novel from the entire frame. This is the outer surface of the SAP. What we see, this is the entire pedicular pillar, as we say, and that is the entire root coming from the dural surface to outside the SAP. Study. We have freed that whole still thing up, to be released. but this ligament is still tight. So you need to cut it. This is the tip of the SAP, which is stuck to the traversing root. It's a piece or a tip of the SAP. A small bony that has been left attached to the traversing root, just above the axilla. So badly at the end that I've been this is now I'm cutting more like I try not to remove the fat of the nerve root. 
kind of final protector of the set of veins and arteries that accompany it. So best retained to prevent the secondary fibrosis around the node. We're now going cranially. But this heart tissue has to go. As I remove it, what you see. Now you can see the, the flavum. This is the flavum which we are cutting. The flavor tissue. This is again the part of the ligament, original. And now I'm yeah, introducing a knife into the disc. Treat the entire nerve root. To carry on the now routine UV procedure. The you can see the nerve root here practice. now, nicely pulsatile. It's a badly degenerated collapsed disc. She's young. I feel I'm in the right position. Move your legs. Right, head, four. Very good. In such a tight foramen, it's so small space. It is very reassuring when the patient is moving her legs and you're banging in the cage. It's priceless, believe me. You don't want your patient waking up with a neurological deficit. So that is where the role of awake and aware anesthesia comes in. I thank you all for patiently going through my videos, my disturbances, my dogs barking. <laughs> so thank you once again for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pesanji. Beautiful. Thank you for your beautiful presentation. And, and it's amazing to the patient awake and, and uh, speaking when screws are putting. <laughs> so um, I want to make sure that uh, in the presented procedure, you do facetectomy and then number to decompression. But uh, you don't do you don't do laminectomy and, and uh, decompression of dural sac, right? I do the laminectomy. I do the contralateral ICLF also. If I have to cut the opposite facet, also I cut that. All done extra flavorly. Oh, okay. Done extra so, flavorly. On my side, I do the entire facetectomy also extra flavorly. Put oh, in the okay. cage. At mm -hmm. the last five minutes of the surgery, that you do the flavor decompression. Uh -huh. not see when the neural elements are not exposed, the surgeon is at peace of mind. Okay. You're using a bar, you're using a chisel, you're using every possible instrument, and you're not worried. Mm -hmm. So when you uh, do the manipulation of Nablo, so you use uh, epidural in, in epidural anesthesia. Yes, sir. We have done mm -hmm. all this under sensory and partial motor epidural anesthesia. We okay. have iced a mixture that is more than adequate. To give a partial motor block as well as a deep sensory block. So, mm -hmm. patient then does not require any other local anesthetic. Mm -hmm. Patient only needs to be rolled with a little bit of a sedative. So, when you're hammering, banging, she's sleeping. You need to counsel the patient in advance. You need to take them into confidence. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll be speaking to you and you speak to them in a nice, soft voice, comfort them. And it works beautifully, sir. It works beautifully. So I'm a little bit concerned about the, uh, the epidural injection as a possible uh, source of infection. So, so that, yeah, true. But then there is, even your screws can be a source of infection and even your rods yeah. can be a source of infection. Even your cage can be. <laughs> so as a matter yeah. of fact, continue with the epidural anesthesia, only sensory component that is 0.25, post-operatively for four days. I don't mm -hmm. remove the epidural catheter for four days. Oh, okay. Patient feels no pain, zero pain of the entire surgery. Mm -hmm. I even ambulate, I even make the patient walk with sensory epidural anesthesia uh -huh. before I remove, stop the pump. Patient is on a pump for four days post-op. Mm -hmm. And I've not okay. had any infections. There's one question in the chat box who has uh, asked, Prof, do you give epidural sensory anesthesia? Is it effective? Yes, sir. It is very, very effective. That is exactly what I'm going to tell you, that we work under a partial motor and a partial sensory, deep sensory block. So mm -hmm. patient has no pain, and yet we retain an element of motor function. 
that retaining of that element of motor function is for the comfort of the surgeon that when I'm in, like I showed you in the last video, despite the SAP osteotomy, despite the facetectomy, the gap was so small. It was so narrow. Now imagine putting in a 12 millimeter cage from there, some amount of traction is going to come somewhere. And you want your patient at that time to be moving her limbs comfortable because moment you hit the root, the patient will cry with pain. Patient will say, am I feeling numbness? I'm feeling heaviness in my leg. You stop, you withdraw, you try to create more space. So that is that key um, functionality of this awake and aware anesthesia, which is priceless, which is priceless. Or else you have to depend upon neuromonitoring all the time. Okay? Is there any fibrillation potential? Did anything happen? But that is again, you know, retrospective. By the time somebody tells you, you've already committed the act. Here the human response is so fast. It's so fast that you, your patient has a chance to escape and you have a chance to escape. So why not use it? It's, it's a wonderful opportunity to, for both the surgeon and the doctor. I understand that there is an element of fear because we are trying to do something new, something different. And, um, but we have standardized this in our center. I have trained four or five of my rotating anesthetists about this, and they are all comfortable with it. As a matter of fact, even the epidural we put under CM guidance. We make the patient sit, put the CM in a lateral position, check the needle's progression, put in the epidural catheter, make the patient lie down, and then give the dose. So, so we're very happy so with this. Okay, so but you're not allowed to communicate with your juniors, right? You, you can't instruct the junior doctors. It's a matter of education. How can you uh, educate young, young doctors? <laughs> <laughs> that is the most difficult question. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, know. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think we deserve to educate the young people. Mm -hmm. uh, a more detailed video of the entire procedure, I think, should uh -huh. be made by me and given to you to be <laughs> uh, on your association. And uh, definitely uh, the monitoring, the steps, the anesthetist part, let them speak. I will make a definite video and I'll put that across to you all of you. So mm -hmm. that, you know, um, this can be taken forward. I want this to be going forward in the world because awake and aware anesthesia, I mean, see, people have been doing it in transforaminal for discectomies, using local only. But when we talk about fusion, we are going really to the next level because here comes the question of end plate preparation, bone graft uh -huh. harvesting, uh -huh. putting in the bone graft, then putting in a cage and then putting in percutaneous screws and rods and fixing the patient up. So you are changing the ball game. We are, it's not the traditional, you know, I see a lot of talk about awake and aware anesthesia, but that's not, not with fusion. With fusion, it's a little different of a ball game. You need to adapt to it. And once you're adapted to it, it's beautiful. So believe me, especially for elderly patients, patients of the age of 80, 70, poor cardiac outputs, it's a nightmare to give that patient a general anesthetic. <laughs> You know, in major hospitals, an ICU bed is reserved. Patient straight goes from the OT to the ICU before he's woken up. Mm. And he requires an intensivist care. Now, all that adds to the financial billing of a patient. It's a load on the patient. It's a load on the system. It's a load on the governmental organizations. Okay, by using this sensory motor mixed epidural anesthesia, good control on blood pressure by using an NTG pump, sedative so that patient doesn't feel the headache of the NTG. Patient is comfortable, awake, aware, cooperative. I showed you a patient who was 80 years old. I showed you a patient who was 23 years old. I showed you both the spectrums. You can use this wherever you wish and however you wish. So that is the advantage. That is the key advantage. The advantage of endoscopic vision, visualization, working extra flavorly, doing a complete fusion extra flavorly, not seeing the dura at all. Why are you worried that you will hurt it or you will harm it? Flavectomy is reserved for the last 10 minutes of the surgery. I've done the entire bony decompression on both sides. I've done the entire process, all bone work completed. Opposite side, osteotomy of the foramen also done. 
last part of the surgery is just the phlebectomy. So that ends the surgery somehow. And then comes only the percutaneous screws and rods. So that's the end of it. So I really will definitely I honor the commitment that I will prepare a detailed video of my next patient itself. And I will see that I send it across. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Any questions from my co-host, Liu Bun Seng? Liu, any questions from you? Thanks, thanks, Raja. Thank you, Prof. I, I just want to ask, Prof, uh, in, in uh, endoscopic uh, uh, fusion, lumbar fusion, uh, whether uh, whether with uh, MIS screw or not, uh, do you do you see that the, the incidence of adjacent uh, 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 degenerative disc problem uh, less than the open method, uh, Professor? Thank you. Sir, I really won't be in a, be in a position to answer that. I'm really not in a position because my earliest fusions date back only to 2017-18. So it's barely a five years time. So I really will not comment about edges in this disease. There are, uh, I mean, I'm really not in a position to, I really appreciate this. And as a matter of fact, I should start studying this fact and this factor and maybe come out with some surprising results for two simple reasons. One is that whether it is UB or Calif, we are both working below the entire muscular bed. We are only elevating the muscular bed. We are not cutting the muscles. There's only dilatation involved. The interspinous ligament is preserved in its entirety. The opposite side, lamina, is just undercut. The facet falls back in place with distraction. It's only one side that you have done a complete facetectomy. And then putting in lots of bone graft and achieving fusion, I'm sure maybe, maybe the incidence of AD, edges in this disease should be less, but really I'm not in a position to comment because it's too short a period of time. Maybe by the time I retire. <laughs> well, 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 thank you very much. We had a wonderful learning session with uh, Professor Shukini Shimura and Professor Malcolm Pestonji. With that, we come to the end of the second session as well. And I would like to close this officially now on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato. I would like to thank both the speakers of today, Professor Masahito Kahabori and Professor Malcolm Pestonji, as well as the chairs, Professor okay. Shin John Ling and Professor Nishimura for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. A sincere thanks to my co-host Liu Bun Sen, as well as a sincere Thanks to our Vice President, Professor Shubin, for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. And as I mentioned earlier, there are around 630 people who have joined us live today. So until we all meet on next Saturday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you.